when we meditate, we follow a technique. Focus on the breath. Learn to be sensitive to when it's long, when it's short, and how it feels when it's long and it's short. Which feels better? And then you can try working with deep and shallow, heavy or light. Focusing on the breath energy in different parts of the body. There's lots to play with here. But even though we have a technique, it doesn't mean that we're trying to force the mind into a mold. And particularly, we're not trying to force it into believing certain things. As the Buddha said, the cure for doubt is not just force a belief. It's learning how to ask the right questions. And the technique we have here is basically guidance in how, in, how to ask the right questions. Like when the Buddha says, train yourself to breathe in and out, sensitive to the entire body. How do you do that? Well, you explore. You experiment. When he says to train yourself to calm the bodily processes, or the bodily fabrication, which is the breath in and coming in and out, how do you do that so that it's comfortable and so you're not just clamping down? or starving yourself for breath energy. So even in the instructions there are questions, but it's a session of guided questions so you can start to explore what's going on in your mind. We have the mind to settle down, not so you can simply be still, but also to learn. And the learning process requires two kinds of questions. One is learning the basic principles, and the other is seeing what's actually going on. You can see this in the way the Buddha has different ways of using what he calls the principle of cross-questioning. Sometimes if someone would ask him a question, and he could see from the way the question was asked that the person was not going to understand the answer without some explanation. So his way of providing explanation was to give an analogy. For example, a man came to him one time and said, why is it that when you teach, some people gain awakening and other people don't? The implication being, maybe there's something wrong with the way he teaches. The Buddha turned around and says, well, have you ever given directions to someone to go from here to Rajgah? And so first he asked what the directions were, so the man gave the directions. And the Buddha said, does everybody who hears these directions get there? And the man says, well, no. Some of them follow the directions, but other people don't follow the directions. They end off, off he said, off in the west someplace. And the Buddha said, it's just like that. When I teach, some people actually follow the instructions and they get there, and other people don't follow the instructions, they go off someplace else. So by questioning the man about how he gives directions, he gave the man a good framework for understanding his answer. There's a path, and the Buddha is the person who points it out, but we're the ones who have to follow it. And this relates directly to the other aspect of cross-questioning, where he wants you to cross-question yourself. Once you've got the basic principles down, that you want to act in a skillful way and your actions really do make a difference. And that's pretty much the sum total of what the Buddha is asking you to believe. Then the next issue is, well, what are you actually doing? What kind of actions are you engaging in? What's the motivation behind the action? What are the results you're getting from the action? And this is a different kind of investigation. The first one is an investigation to get to understanding. This one is to get to more alertness, more sensitivity. What are you actually doing? What kind of results are you getting? This is where you really do cut through the doubt. Establishing those basic principles are just giving you a framework, some working hypotheses. But as the mind begins to settle down, you want to understand how you got it to settle down. 
when the mind is not settling down, you want to ask, okay, what's going on here? What am I doing that's getting in the way of it settling down? In some cases, it's simply the fact that you're carrying a lot of thoughts and memories from where you were yesterday, where you were last night, what you were doing yesterday, what you were doing last night. And in that case, you have to simply tell yourself, that kind of thinking is not going to help in the meditation right now. The thoughts may come up, but you don't have to engage them. You don't have to, as I say, entire weave them any further. Just leave them as loose ends. You don't have to make a nice little basket of your thought before you put it aside. You don't have to finish off the narrative. Just leave those ends hanging for the time being. You've got other work to do right now. Or if you're upset because your meditation is not going as well today as it went yesterday, again, yesterday is not the topic of the meditation. If you see that if you're constantly thinking about yesterday's meditation, how good it was, how much better it was than today's, it's good to think of that story I think I've told before about the person who sold Chinese dumplings. Where we were in town, there'd be these people who'd come driving down the road every now and then with a little loudspeaker on the top of their trucks announcing that they were selling something. There were the people who sold salt. There were the people who sold huge water jars. And the ones who were selling salt and water jars didn't engage in much advertising. They just called out, salt, salt, or water jars, water jars. But the man who sold dumplings, he was a little bit special. You'd hear, hear him coming over the rise. He would always say, today's dumplings are better than yesterday's. And the next day, two or th three days later, we'd come back, today's dumplings are better than yesterday's. It got you thinking exactly when was it going to reach the platonic ideal of Chinese dumplings. But as someone pointed out to me one day, he said, well, exactly where are yesterday's dumplings right now? If they haven't already gone into the cesspool, they're on their way. So whatever the guy was going to sell was going to be better than yesterday's dumplings. And the same principle applies to your yesterday's meditation. No matter how good it was, it's not nearly as good as today's meditation, because this is what you're doing right now. Yesterday's meditation is now just a memory. And we're not here to pay attention to memories. We're here to pay attention to what we're doing right now, how you're focusing on the breath, how it's working. If it's not working, what can you do to make it? work better. But the same principle of looking at yourself applies all throughout the practice. In fact, the Buddha has you start out on a very everyday level with your thoughts, your words, and your deeds. These are the instructions he gave to his son, Rahula, when Rahula was seven years old. Before you do something, ask yourself, what is the motivation? What do I expect to come about as the result of this action? And while you're doing it, look at the results that you're actually getting. If you see that you're not getting good results, you're harming yourself, harming other people, stop. Same with the motivation. If you anticipate there's going to be harm, you don't even do the act to begin with. It's only when you don't anticipate harm that you go ahead and act. But if you find some unexpected bad results coming, you stop. Or if after you've done with the action, you reflect on the results of that action, you realize that it actually did cause harm, even though you didn't expect it and you didn't see any harm while you were doing it. Then you resolve not to repeat the action. So this is a different kind of cross-questioning. You're not trying to establish a general principle. You're trying to figure out, what am I doing right now, so you can judge it against the principle of whether it's skillful or not. And the judging here is important. It's not the judgment of a judge trying to decide whether to send you to jail. It's the judgment of a craftsman, like a carpenter, working on something on his carpenter table. He's sitting on his bench, working, say, on a piece of furniture, and he realizes that he just shaved the wood a little bit too far, because what is he going to do? How does he compensate for the mistake he made? Now, 
that kind of judgment is important because you're working on you've got a work in progress and you're trying to make it as useful and as good as you can. So that your next action will be a skillful action, even when you've made mistakes. Or like a pianist sitting on her bench. She's playing along, she realized she just a little something unexpected with the volume or unexpected with her tempo. Or phrased a phrase in a way that she hadn't expected to. Now the question is, okay, is that something that has potential that she wants to weave into the rest of the piece or the rest of the performance? Or is it something she's got to compensate for? So you're judging a work in progress. So the next time around you can do the skillful thing. In this way your actions are judged not just by the intention or not just by the outcome, but by both. Because you're working on a skill. You're trying to see what you're doing that's not skillful so you can make adjustments. To bring your actions, and your actions include your thoughts, up to the standard. It's up to the general principle that you've already established. So there are two kinds of cross-questioning going on here. One is the kind of cross-questioning that establishes a principle so you can understand a teaching, how it fits into a larger picture. And then there's a cross-questioning of yourself. What are you doing right now? What are the results? And the Buddha has you carry this in when you look at your thoughts. What kind of thoughts lead the mind to distraction? What kind of thoughts lead it into stillness? If you find the mind's getting distracted, how do you deal with it to get away from that distraction? He gives lots of recommendations, and there's some general principles in his recommendations, but then again, it's a matter of applying the principles to your own, to your own practice to see what works for you. So we're not here just trying to clone a particular mind state or clone a particular set of beliefs. We use the general principles as working hypothesis so we can get into this issue of why is the mind creating suffering, and how can it stop. So as we're working on the breath here, we're developing qualities of mind that make it easier and easier to see what's actually going on. The mindfulness part, the part that keeps things in mind, that's to keep your mind you. You want to do this skillfully. You want to stay with the breath and you want to maintain the mind here. And then there's the alertness to watch what's actually happening. And there's a quality of ardency, which is the desire to do it well. And part of doing it well means learning how to judge your actions in a way that's actually helpful. The word judgment has a lot of bad press these days. That's because we tend to pass unskillful judgments. So you have to learn how to look at your judgments, see where they're skillful and where they're not. And don't get yourself tied up when you see yourself doing something unskillful, because we're here to learn a craft. And of course there are going to be mistakes along the way, but if you pretend that they're not there, that's not going to undo them, and that's certainly not going to help you further down the line. You've got to say, oh yes, there was a mistake, but now I'm going to learn from it. That's the attitude the Buddha asked you to develop, because that's the attitude that gets results. These two kinds of questioning are parallel to what they do in a cross-examination in the Vinaya. Say that the monk, one monk, monk A, suspects monk B of having committed an offense to the point where he's ready to accuse him in the Sangha. Well, the first step is to turn to monk C, who is an expert in the monk's roles, and start asking him questions publicly in the Sangha about the rules that are related to that particular action. That's the kind of questioning that helps to establish principles. So everybody in the Sangha has a chance to refresh his memory. Okay, well, this is what the rules are. This is how far they go. This kind of action is considered an offense. This kind of action is not considered an offense. So once you establish the principles and everybody's informed, okay, then you ask Lee or the other monk to question him about his behavior. When he gives leave, then you start asking him. 
This is where you go into the particulars. What are you, what did you do? And here you're trying to ferret out the specific actions so you can finally pass judgment on whether an offense or not. So you have two sides. One is questions that establish the principles so everybody understands them, and the next set of questions tries to get down to the particulars of the actions to see whether or not they constitute an offense. The same principle applies with your mind. We're trying to establish the basic principles. What kind of intentions are skillful? Which kind of intentions are not? What qualities of mind lead to skillful intentions? What qualities lead to unskillful ones? Look at yourself. How do, they actu how do your actions actually fit in to the general principles? What things do you do that are skillful? What things do you do that are not skillful? This is like the cross-examination of the, of the accused. The difference here, of course, is you're not accusing somebody. You're looking at yourself with the purpose of trying to develop mastery, developing more alertness, more sensitivity, so you can really master this principle of skillful action in the way you actually act, speak, think, to see how far that principle of skillfulness can go. Can it really put an end to suffering? The Buddha says it does, and you can take his statement as a working hypothesis, but you don't really prove it to yourself. And you, you've at least gained the first level of awakening. As he said in the simile of the elephant, you go into the forest. You're looking for a big bull elephant because you've got the kind of work that needs to be done by a bull elephant. And you see big footprints in the ground. Now you don't immediately jump to the conclusion that those must be the prints of the bull elephant because you know that there are dwarf females with big feet. It might be theirs. But it looks promising. So you go down the path. You find scratch marks high up in the trees. Again, you don't come to the inclusion, conclusion that it's a big bull elephant that just went through there, because there are tall females with tusks. It might be theirs. It's only when you get to the clearing where the big bull elephant is standing. That's when you know, oh, here's a big bull elephant. I said in the same way when you practice. The Buddha talks to you about practicing the precepts, developing stages of concentration. And you start seeing good results that come from the precepts. But that doesn't even count as footprints. The footprints start when you get to good concentration. Ah, here's, some, here's a sign that this might work. But again, he doesn't want you to jump to the conclusion that, yes, you've confirmed it, because you haven't. The scratch marks are the powers that can be developed from concentration. But even that's not proof. The real proof comes when you've had your first taste of awakening. You've seen that there is a deathless, so you really can find a dimension at which, as the Buddha says, you touch with your body. It means you touch with your whole awareness. That there really is an end to suffering. That is the point he said when your conviction is confirmed. But how do you see this? It's by examining your own actions and getting more and more skillful in how you think and how you act and how you speak. That's through this double process of, one, learning how to question your way to an understanding of the teachings, and then two, questioning yourself as to what you're doing and the results that you're doing, exactly how skillful they are. And it's through this questioning that you come to certainty. You follow the principle of what the Buddha calls appropriate attention to that question of what's skillful and what's not. That's how you develop the factor of awakening called analysis of qualities. That's how you develop your discernment, the kind of discernment that actually does lead to release. And it's the release that counts. So keep this in mind. You're not just trying to force your mind into a mold. 
you're learning the skills that you need in order to test things for yourself. That's how your doubts can come to an end.